Use your outdoor voice. Outdoor. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, and I am the newcom moderator. And this is Jay Green, Jay's the town administrator. Kaylee Mesador, who knows the town clerk. And over here is Christine Hoyt, who is the chairman of the board of selectmen. And we have Donna. And Donna Kingston, who is community development director. For the first time in a long time, not in from town meetings, <laughs> which is a great thing. Um, so if this is not in the town meeting ever, and doesn't understand how it all kind of plays out, then we're going to skip a lot of the PowerPoint because you all know how, how it works. Granted, we're in a unique situation this year. Um, so bundle is necessary for Thursday night, although we will have a tent over here. Some things I do want to tell you that is different this year is the checking in process with the town clerk. Um, the little shed at the beginning, as you drive in, Haley and her staff are going to check you in and, and direct in the four words we hear to direct you down the front. You will have, um, like I said, a tent over here, two chairs. Um, we'll have a couple of porta potties in the back. Everyone has to fish their way to the bathrooms in the dark. And um, we will have parking. Um, all around here and accessible parking for those that need it, and they can enter in through this way. It's right here, Meyer. Oh, it's over here now. Oh, yeah, we're back to the yeah. we, we moved this around a couple of times to be laying this out. So, um, so anybody that needs a good one can use that. Right. So, I remind you to come out this way. We came down the ground in all the money is here. So, you're going to come in as if you're going to go to Racine's? Yeah. Just past Ronnie's, and you just come right around it in. Yes, you can. And actually, we're going to encourage people to go in that direction well, so that we can track you and we're going to block that gate. And Kelly says, We're going to block that gate. <laughs> so well, that should make it easy. <laughs> the uh, forest wardens and uh, Chief Bacon, at a minimum, will, will be here. We'll help out with that uh, part. We can. <laughs> We are going to have um, a peer will be the selectman appropriately spread, the town administrator, um, town clerk, myself, finance committee, chair. finance committee chairman, and that's the group that's up it. here. And maybe a couple of department heads, depending on how we can space people. Department heads will also be set down here along with school representatives. Uh, and then the town meeting members will start at the end of the platform here to go back appropriately space and then we'll have the same setup in the tent that we'll be over here to mind but yes uh, yes good question so we will not have a sound problem this year we have hired thank you to christine we have hired a professional sound person from encore encore audio encore audio he has um done meetings in the past so he knows what to do there will be microphones on the stand set up for people to talk to. There'll be a marker where the first people should stand. Um, he has the ability to adjust the sound, so no one will need to touch the microphone. Uh, if it happens, he's got backups. The people on the stage will each have their own individual microphone. So even department heads will be able to go to the freestanding microphones and ask their questions. Um, and, and, and that should work really well. There'll be speakers in the pavilion here, there'll be speakers in the tent. There'll also be lights in both areas, so that it will be well lit, so people can see. Um, plastic, plastic tents? Classical. Classical tents is, for, is not providing, but they'll be setting up the tent this week for us, and we keep out that. Um, any other questions about logistics? Okay. So, Haley, do you have anything you want to add? All right, quick one. Yes. In the event that it's, let's say, just for lack of another word, intolerably cold, there's going to be speakers going in. 
We hadn't planned on it being intolerably cold in September, but yeah. it's 2020, so maybe we should have. I think we're going to have to play that by ear at this point. Um, Cat brought a blanket up here, Mrs. Baker. Uh, you brought your blanket. You're ready. Yes, yes. Very fortunate. Yes. <laughs> so hopefully it will not be intolerably cold. Um, our, our hope is to move this meeting right along. Are you going to have meters or anything like that? We're planning on it. Um, so we're hoping to just move the meeting right along and keep everybody uh, to, to the questions before them and, and not pontificate about their opinions for community. Um, did I miss anything? I don't think so. All right, um, as we usually do, we'll call the roll, the ward. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So presentations, typically at the annual meeting, we present the town report, we present the scholarship. We're just announcing that this year. We are cutting back on any unnecessary uh, contact. Haley will have the list to cover some contact uh, tracing. If God forbid something should happen, we have that list as well. Yes? Yep. Okay. So to the board. This, um, starting with Article 1. Does anybody have any questions? Wait, wait, let me get to it. Okay, Article I'm 1. I'm going to do a quick overview of this presentation, which most of you have already seen anyways. So I'm just going to run through those slides about what is town meeting, as you all know. If you see a slide that you want us to cut that you want to comment on, feel free to just raise your hand and we'll stop. I'll just quickly go through them. How to participate, moderator. Haley, can I just make one announcement? Yes. I just wanted to um, let people know, I know that you see me with my laptop. I am recording, hopefully, uh, via Zoom for anybody who is not able to participate tonight. Um, I'm real, So I just wanted you all to be aware that you are being recorded um, and I'm using Zoom to do so. Again, that's hopefully it's working. Um, <laughs> so far, so good. And we will have that up on yeah, if it recorded properly, then yes, it'll go up on the website for people to see. And we are going to put both the, um, this presentation um, and the 40 hour information of um, PowerPoint that will be up on the website also tomorrow. It just moves right along. This is how you move right along. Question. Stop. Yeah. Um, oh, amendments. I just saw a flash by. We are. Um, we we will insist that all amendments. Anybody who wants to offer up an amendment, it must be in writing, so we have proper language, and it must go to the town clerk. Um, and then we'll amend accordingly. But if we don't have it in writing. It's, it's just not going to work. We need to have specific language. So amendments will be in writing. Everybody's all set with just our general town meeting information. And we're on to our article. So for the first time in a long time, Article 1 does not contain fence viewers and measures of wooden bar. So we don't have to elect anybody. Thank you, Mr. Shepley. <laughs> nice job. <laughs> that means there's no colonial period anymore. <laughs> Not about measure fence. There um, is. They are the annual articles and it does contain the salaries for the elected officials. Any questions on any of those? Okay. Okay, uh, article five is the omnibus article for personal services and operating expenses. This hand, um, shows what was approved last year and what's recommended this year. Does anyone have any questions for administrator, Mr. Baker? Yeah, I have a question. It's relative to Adams Memorial building. There's a lot of activity there. I don't know that function of that building is what it's going to be because it hasn't really been clarified I think it's limited. Okay. Uh, and I don't know if anybody can just mention 
Jake, yeah, your timing is actually really good. So the work that you see in the Valley Street area right now is all of the Lincoln Street South Area Storm Drainage Program. So they're working on all the storm drainage in that area. So that's the work that you see. It's not related to the school building itself. Over the last year, I would say, give or take, a rooftop heating and air conditioning system has been installed in the gymnasium, administrative offices, lobby, and the locker room bathroom areas of Memorial. The master idea, the master concept that the selectmen still have is to reutilize the auditorium, gymnasium, lobby, administrative offices for a community-based function. That would be council on aging, director of the here. They always miss that. <laughs> it's always like late in the day, and I always miss that second sheet. At any rate, the vision is to finish that out nicely or over a period of time, be able to move council on aging over. In fact, we were just discussing today, the reality is with COVID in our uh, House on Aging program is so popular that we don't have enough space in the visitor center building anymore to host those, those programs. Layer on your COVID restrictions, and now you're down to about maybe five or six people being able to participate. So we actually were going through the building today in anticipation of turning on those rooftop units and being able to allow Council on Aging to, to use it. That's the, the end goal. The classroom wing, uh, the three stories of the classroom wing or the two stories, that has already been put out for a request for proposals for developers to turn that into housing. Now we have a good four, five, six developers interested in pre-COVID times who are interested in developing out that portion of the building. A few of the developers uh, were very interested. They were close to bidding then COVID happened and it paused the entire process. But that is still the master plan is to have the old classroom wing developed into some level of housing and have the auditorium, gymnasium, that area still utilized for community purposes. Frankly, you know, we, we could have tried to spread out in the auditorium if it was, uh, it's not, it hasn't been utilized in years, it's not ready. But, you know, that's one of the reasons why we're meeting out here is from a town facility standpoint, we don't have a large meeting space under town control. We have to use Plunkett Building, school district, uh, so that would give us some flexibility for it. So that's the that's the master. The process is slow as molasses, but it's it's moving. The building has been taken care of. Inside. If the building is stabilized, there's heat and it has water service. It has heat, uh, not from the boiler system, but from an external furnace to keep everything from. It needs updating. If you walk in there, it's still 1953. Yeah. Which has you know some charm to it, but it needs to be. The windows are old. That it's going to be a multi-year project. I have a question about the school too. Certainly, the police from like Pittsfield are using that facility. What are they using that for? So are they just meeting for themselves. No, our Adams Police Department offers training to other departments, and they use that building for tactical training and school-related entry training, active shooter training. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Robinson, what are you going to use the Council on Aging building for after they move to the, the other uh, floor? Right. We would anticipate the first floor being utilized as it was designed as a visitor center with all the hub of traffic around there for the trail. The second floor, I would like to rent out for, for lease income in order to put towards maintenance of the building. If somebody came forward and wanted to, you know, they're interested in buying the building, that would be up to the selectmen to make that available or not. But the vision is to actually have that as a visitor center, staff during peak tourist season, and promote local businesses, offer bathrooms for trail users, etc. So the building still is responsibility of the town. Still, yes. Why can't you sell it? We could sell it if we thought that there was an interested buyer, but that would be up to the selectmen to decide that. Role. Just a suggestion. I got a question about the school. The interested parties for the housing are put on hold, you said. Are, are they still seem to be interested though? Or yes. is it going to be like a. <laughs> they are very interested. And in fact, they're very interested in waiting to see if we're going to pass one of the zoning bylaws. And that will make it more attractive for them to actually go. It'll through. make it easier for them to get permitted. Yes. Okay. Yep. All right. 
Any other questions on this? Or? Yep, Mr. Baker, go ahead. Uh, my question to, on flood control. Last year we appropriated five hundred dollars for flood control. This year it's six hundred dollars. Now, back in the fifties, when that project was put in, the federal government put a lot of money into that, but there was an obligation on the part of our community to kind of upkeep the maintenance on it. If you look over in the river uh, from uh, around the Mill Street area down to Cook Street. You will see that it almost looks like either somebody's lawn is growing there or a forest is growing there. And then in the Topic Brook, where that comes in to meet the Hoosie, there's all kinds of debris and rocks and so on that could interfere with the flood if we ever had one again. And I'm just wondering if, if we have an obligation, will we have an obligation to clear those flood shoes from time to time and maintain them? as well as the wall. I don't know if you can address that issue. I can tell you that once a year, the Army Corps of Engineers come up to ensure that the town is doing what's required to be done originally with the 1950, I think 56 or 57, it was turned over to us. And we pass every year. Um, it, it looks obstructed, but it's not. Uh, the biggest concern that we have is some of the vegetation control, but it's a waterway, so you can't just put equipment, Tom will tell you that, the, the conservation work. Uh, in fact, just the other day, UPW noticed one of the flood valves, the flat gates, uh, was obstructed with some material. They called the chairman of the Conservation Commission, Emergency Commission. They got in there and they, they cleared it all out. It's working as designed. Uh, it was uh, knowing from Mark Adams what I know in their system. We're lucky we're not as sophisticated, but Army Corps of Engineers says we're doing what needs to be done. Is it ever enough? Probably not. Well, when I saw the figure last year, five hundred dollars. I didn't know how far $500 was going to go to maintain the, the flood shoes and so on. And this year it's 600, but you know, I just needed an explanation. We are in touch with necessary people to check yes, on that. They expect it to that's, walk. That's good. So yep. we're not arrears or anything. No. no. Um, Thank you. We spend hundreds of thousands of dollars stretching it out several years ago. I believe so. I believe we spent close to half a million dollars. Yeah, Article 20, we can get to this when we get to Article 20 in more detail, is the total number of units. So that building can probably, depending upon how the developer develops it, let's just use, let's just say it can have 20 units. Anywhere from 20 to 40 percent of the total units built in the entire complex has to be affordable. All that means is, is that your income check, your income is checked. And we'll talk about that because it's all in the bylaw. Okay. So for example, if there's, correct me on my math, but if there's 20 units built, then that means that one or two has to be affordable. That's it. It's, it's a small number compared to the larger number. What does that mean essentially? The developer can access state funds up front. The return is you make some of those units available for people with the workforce style income for a period of time. I think the bylaws drafted for 30 years. That's the give and take. You want public money, 
That's what the, the law is saying. You have to make some of those affordable. And, and for a developer, you know, in the Berkshires, in the last year and a half, I've talked to a lot. I said, how come you're not interested in that? How can we get you interested in that? Yeah. It's the same conversation I've had with everybody is they're always short a, a chunk of money in order to finish the project. Good example is the Jones and Armory block on Park Street. I've been in that building now two or three times. It's framed out, it's plumb, it has electrical power. All it needs is finished fixtures, flooring, sheetrock, and a ceiling, and that's it, it's done. I don't understand why it's not finished. The cost of finishing is just expensive to do these types of projects and virtues. So what can the town of Adams do to make itself more attractive to developers is pass a bylaw like this, that if the developer chooses to do a project in Adams and chooses to do a project under 40R through our planning board, they have access to that money. That's the simplest nuts and bolts operation. But so many times, at least what, three out of those developers said, you have 40R on the books. No, not yet. Let me know when you do, I'll be back. And we've had that conversation with a few other, other people as well. Doesn't mean they have to use it, but it's an option for them. Uh, um, could we use 40% 40, uh, 40 rather than 20 Because we know, based on discussions like that, we know that the planning board is going to institute 40%. We have seven people on the planning board, and I'm hard, I understand four people are going to agree with 40%. So why don't we just call it 40% as opposed to 20? Donna, you want to take that? Because that's not. I, mean, I'm not, I, I don't know if I know your point. I mean, we, we are allowed to do a range. And so the, correct. the state program says, you know, in order to do a 40R, you have to have a minimum of 20%. Correct. And we According to the regulation. Because we, our own analysis yes. is that to be a balanced community, mm -hmm. we need higher rent housing. You know, a lot of the uh, communities back east, they push out worker, um, you know, working sure, housing. Sure. Um, we don't have that problem. We have to attract the higher end housing to be back. Right. So that's why we felt it was important to limit the 20 to 40 percent. It doesn't mean planning board can't even go beyond 40 percent if they do so, if they choose to do so, but it would be evaluating an individual project and looking at the whole presentation of the development. So if the, if the developer came back, and I'm not trying to be argumentative, mm -hmm. if the developer came back and said, I cannot attract working class individuals to rent my property. Mm -hmm. I need to increase the subsidized portion to 60%. Then the planning board of seven people make that decision. Well, I think what your problem is, is you're, you're suggesting that affordable is not working. That's precisely what this program is about. It is for working people. It right. is the I mean, I think Jen, you said it in town meetings. It's, um, it's you know, not, the I'm new not. school teacher, the new fire. Um, right. Work, work, work. Your subsidy, Tom, you say subsidy. Yes. It's essentially, sub, it's not subsidized per unit per se, okay. it's subsidized up front. So let's say you're a developer, you're going to put 10 units in, in your development. Sure. The bylaw says anywhere from 20 to 40 percent. So you're no, you know, you're looking at one, two, three, you're looking at a few units. Sure. The units have to be finished the same exact as all the others. You're going to put marble in, you're putting them in all. Yes. The subsidy comes up front. So the state says, all right, Mr. Robinson, I'm going to give you X amount of dollars mm -hmm. per unit affordable to help you finish your project. That could be, you might only need 150 grand to go from what you've got in private capital mm -hmm. to what you need to make the project work. Right. You say to yourself, okay, that's a trade-off. I'm going to get the money up front but I've got an easement on my property for 30 years that says I have to offer those units at an affordable rent. The affordable rent, let's say you determine your market rate for your building based on your furnishings mm -hmm. is 1100, 1200 bucks. That affordable rent may be only as low as 800, $900. So the unit itself isn't subsidized continuously. 
They'll, they never will get another check from the government. They get that check from the state up front on their development costs. Am I misspeaking, Donna, or is that, that's been my research that I've done. So it's not like a continuous subsidy. They could in turn, down the road, say, uh, you know, I don't, I can return that money now because now I've got, I could fill it with market rate housing all up front. Sure. They may say, here state, take your 150,000 back. Now I wanna charge market rate for those other two units. Mm -hmm. The other scenario you present is if the project is built and they come back and they wanna add more, I don't, I don't think that's permitted because this is the development tool. They have to present their entire plan up front to the planning board. They have to have that conversation with the planning board up front. 20%, 30%, or 40%. Is a developer probably gonna always come in and wanna shoot high? Depends on their financial. But that ceiling by operation of the bylaw is 40%. The foundation is 20% in order to get the, to be able to have the minimum impact you know, on the project. So it's really based on the nature of the project. Some of these, the properties that are identified for 40R aren't that large. So you're not talking about a large number of, of units that would be affordable anyway. So at the end of the day, it kind of depends on what access the developer has to their private capital. You know, we've talked with a few people and they say, we may not need it, but we like the fact that it's an option because we don't know at the time that we build the project, what the construction market's gonna be, that, that type of scenario. So let me understand this. Uh, just to clarify in my own mind, the subsidy is during the point of construction. Yes. It's not related to the rents involved in the property. The rents have to be monitored and controlled once the project is built on the number of units that are agreed to. So, so if 20% of your total number of units are affordable, that has to be monitored and that burden falls on the town and its co housing contractor to make sure that you're, you're charging affordable rents for those units. That's so it. Comes to, it becomes the developer's responsibility to offer the affordable rents. Yes. After the subsidy is paid by the state to the developer. To build it. So the town has no responsibility to the developer in respect to subsidies. Correct. There's no money from town government at all. In fact, we get paid. So the state says, whenever this was originally passed, the state says, you know, we have a housing problem in the Commonwealth. So we're going to pass legislation a zoning law that municipalities can adopt that encourages the workforce housing so our workforce can actually afford housing. So you've seen it work in the eastern part of the state. Well, it also helps us out too. So what the state says is, we want you to pass this. If you pass it, we're going to give you an incentive payment that has to be used towards the infrastructure that it's some additional housing development would have. The types of development that we're talking about here in Adams isn't going to have that big of an impact, but it's going to have, we're going to get paid still for passing that we can use for road surface, we can use for drainage work. Uh, you'll see here we have 217,000 programmed out of capital to pay for sewer work on Commercial Street. We have that money now, we can use it for that. So there's an incentive payment for us. When the developer comes in and starts actually building a project under 40R, we also get paid as well for those units. So the town gets paid, the developer gets paid, the trade-off is two or three or four units, they have to charge rent a little lower. And the way I look at that, the way I say it is, that's the price of using public money to finish your project. It's an incentive payment, it's an incentive program. One last question. And would the developer be charged the same tax rate that you and I are paying? at the same uh, value. In other words, I'm not talking title. What I'm saying is, they are going to pay the same amount of taxes as I pay. Yes, this has nothing to do with tax rates. It has tax nothing rate. to do with tax rates. No. The developer is responsible to pay 100% of the value of the property in taxes like yes. I do yes. for the guy who owns the Yes, unit. because the assessors are going to go in there. They're going to look at unit 100. Mr. and Mrs. Baker live in Unit 100. Mm -hmm. You live in Unit 101. It's identical. The assessor doesn't know what you pay rent. They don't know what the baker's paying rent. All they know is that's finished with a marble countertop. You've got five shower heads in your. I'm making this up. Obviously. You got five shower heads, etc. George and the rest of the board of assessors say thank you, and he's paying 
whatever the whatever the asset and whatever the assessors determine the value be does not matter what the rent of the units are. I'm not trying to monopolize the conversation, but I'm going to use the example of uh, middle school. You develop the classroom portion in the house. Is that property, does that property belong to the town or does that belong to the developer? So the way that we wrote the RFP is we're open to we're open to what makes sense in order to encourage the development. So from my perspective as a town administrator, I don't want property. I want it on the tax rolls, I want a tax, I want to expand the tax base, and I don't want to have to maintain it. We don't want to have to maintain it. But if the developer says, I just want to condominiumize it. You own town, you continue to own the gymnasium, that portion of the building, but we'll own the classroom, we're prepared to do that. We could also take the ground lease. In other words, the town will always own the underlying property, but the developer owns a portion of the building that they put in. It depends on the tax impact for the developer, and it depends on their availability, you know, what they want to do. We're open-minded to it. We're obviously going to do what's best for the town, but we want to be flexible so that we can encourage them to actually develop it. Rather than laying it out. So regardless, I would just add, regardless of the ownership, they would still have to pay taxes mm -hmm. uh, because it's based on the use of right. the building, and it would be a commercial residential private right? use. Mm -hmm. It's not private. It's not private. Okay. If you wanted to sell that at some point, who's on the deed, and what, what, what? How does that? How does that? Town? Yes, you folks, town meeting would decide. Even though you have this other situation on the second and third floor, mm -hmm. they only be leasing it? It's, it's case by case, it depends. They could lease it, they could buy it outright. Some folks said they wanted the entire building. You know, what they would do with the entire building, that that's up to them. But these are. So are you willing to sell the entire building and move the gym, the auditorium, and the office that we want to use for the town? If the price is right, the project is right and the tax implications are right. I, I want to speak for this selection, okay. <laughs> but I, I think that that will be, you know, their, their, their point right now was in the building is before my time. So I'm speaking from institutional history. The gymnasium is a very nice facility for an athletic community. The auditorium, although it's dated, I like 1950s architecture, so I like the auditorium. We didn't, the selectmen did not think that there would be really a private interest in that. So that's how the genesis of well, we'll keep that side of the building. When we walked around with some of the developers, none of them had committed, but they asked us and said, well, we might be able to do X, Y, Z with this. Would you be willing to sell it? And, and we said, yes. If that's the case, you just have to go back, select them. We have to work together, figure out, all right, what do we do with council and anything? We have options. It's really, at the end of the day, it's the highest and best use of that property. So, and, and each developer is going to be different. Some of them, walking around the building, we were over there today again, the classroom wing is the easiest to build. You have all your utility chases built in one shot and you can build up. Gymnasium and auditorium are, are a little different. But that classroom wing, you know, walking around, I was here, I was listening to the developers, it's just center block. So they know that the construction costs, you know, we'll be able to control them. They were excited about the building, it was nice to see that. And also remember that town meeting will be the one to vote to sell the property. If, if the board of selectmen will be present, if it comes, the board of selectmen presents to town meeting their their wish to uh, buy property similar to when we bought property for where the train station is. So it ultimately will come back to the town meeting for any sale of property. Any other questions on Article Five? Yep, Scott. I mean, the transfer station. Where is there a $1,000 increase? The uh, personal furniture? Uh, the second custodian and permanent transfer station is pending. It's a split job. That's why I thought. That's coming out of that special plan. Right now. Yes. Okay. Second question. Yep. Uh, the station. Operating expenses is only fifty thousand dollars or eighty thousand dollars for the transfer station. What is the town getting in return? So the transfer station is funded partially by this budget on the tax rate, and it's also funded by the sticker fees, the <laughs> user fees. The town is charged to remove all the recycling. 
were charged to remove the municipal solid waste. We make a portion of money on any scrap. So we don't charge anyone to drop off the scrap. And then frankly, if somebody drives up and they don't have a sticker, we take it anyway, because we're paid for that scrap. That money fluctuates depending on the scrap market. Uh, we charge for rubber tires. That's about all we take. It's not an income bearing business, never has been, probably never will be able to. We have to look at it as a service that the community wants. Uh, we try as our best to try to recover those costs through the user permit program. So Berkshire, excuse me, Northern Berkshire Solid Waste Management District manages those contracts to remove the waste from the transfer station facility. Those contracts just went up. Please don't ask me because I don't remember off the top of my head, but they, they actually went up substantially. That's why the selectmen decided to go up in the, the permit fee by $25. Now we're still more cost effective than other communities doing that. But we have to carry still a line item in the budget because that user fee does not cover all the costs of the transfer station. So what we try to do is put as much of it towards that user fee, the revolving account, as much as we can, but we still have to carry a line item in the budget essentially to subsidize its operation. We'd love it to pay for itself, but the rubbish business is just not, it's getting more expensive. So, uh, why is it just a low cost spending structure? Uh, going down by, what's the thousand dollars the accountant's personal service. It's a, we had a retiree. A retiree, retiree who was at the higher end of the pay scale, your replacement yeah. position was younger. So you're expecting to fill it. It's filled and it's filled with somebody that hasn't been here as long as Barbara was. Barbara had 30, 38 years, so she was on the high end of the pay scale. Any other questions on Article 5 that I missed? Article 6, um, debt service, and we are going to be upgrading the enterprise software um, out of the technology fund, so that will not impact the tax rate. Any questions on the debt service? Okay. Article 7. Article 7 is the capital infrastructure and equipment outlay that will come from free cash, and you can see on pages 12 um, what the purchases are going to be for capital. Any questions? I have one question about this article. Well, um, the transfer station landfill cap. Yeah. Um, they said that we have to return that. Do we have a failure on the cap that's in place now? It has done, you know, it's the swale, it's the it's not a failure of the cap, it's a failure of the stormwater management system on it. Uh, swales, it's just over time, they fill in. So they need to, we, need, we did part of the work last year. Cap, two portions of that cap are still uncovered and covered. The remaining work is covered by this on the covered section. It's mostly stormwater right now. It's, yeah, it's a road, it's a road in its structure. It's, it's not addressed, it will continue to be, you know, Go deeper and deeper. Would it affect the water around that area, the trucks in that area? No, no. It's it's in fact it's it's to avoid any. You know, I, I I realize that, but I, it seems to be like maybe have a little bit of failure or something that's not touching the water in that area. Okay, any other questions on the capital? Mr. Baker. Uh, my question is on the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, just want to know, are we operating at full capacity for that unit now? We, we, long ago when we played, put that thing in, we weren't quite capacity. We, we invited our dad to somebody near, here by any going in with us. Just just wondering, here we are with us. Maximum capacity for a wastewater treatment plant is designed to handle about 10 million gallons work of petroleum a day. Uh, in a dry season, we're processing just about 2 million gallons a day. Wet season, about 2.5 million gallons a day. Aeration basins one, two, and three are shut down. And uh, clarifier number two is shut down. So we're running on really about 50% infrastructure on, on the plant. We shouldn't be doing that. We 
because we have too much wear and tear on that side of the pan. So what we have to do is try to get the other side modernized, updated, being into what's called the duplex operation system. What you're going to pay for it here with the seventy-five thousand dollars is the computer control system that monitors all of the, particularly the chemical system in there. I didn't think the computer was that old, but apparently it's a 1990-something version, and we've attempted to repair it two or three times, and we're just reaching the end of that technology life cycle. So if this component fails permanently, that plant is shut down, and we're in trouble with BPP. So it's, going to come, it's basically going to repair the brain of the plant. We're still accepting waste from North Adams. They still pay us. Gary charges them. When I was in North Adams, I paid Adams. Now I collect from North Adams. I like being on the collection side better. Uh, from the farms, I think discharges into there. Walmart discharges into there. And Hardman Park discharges uh, into us. It's not as much as you think, but it's, we still get it. Helps it helps Peter Yes. It helps. It's an expensive operation. Anything else on our episode? Article A is, and I'm going to say this correctly, Thursday night, the Hoosick Valley Regional School District. <laughs> so I want to say that in Cheshire. Nice. Um, the Hoosick Valley Regional School District um, portion of town. Questions, Mr. Baker? I know in the budget reduction, we've got to let some people go. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what, what the impact is on a total operation there. How many? students we expect compared to last year okay that would definitely be a question for mr dean and, and someone from the school district on thursday evening all right my, my other question deals with busing transportation mm -hmm. you know we've been we've been taken back under the rug we had to beat up the state a couple times to mm -hmm. get them to agree to the contract early on when they were paying 100 percent of our transportation reimbursement and I'm, I'm wondering what the percentage is today because it certainly has got closer to 50 50 years. Uh, so, again, it's my understanding that Mr. Dean and probably Mrs. Schneider, the business agent from the school district, will be here Thursday. So, those are very appropriate questions for them that I should be able to answer. I can fumble my way through and start, but they're the subject matter experts. Let them answer the question. Any other questions for Article 8? Okay, Article 9 is the Northern Berkshire uh, Vocational Regional School District. And hopefully we will have representation there. Their budget has passed the necessary communities needed to be a budget. So there you go. Um, articles 10 through 13 are the transfers to special funds. One thing I'll point out to everybody, on article 11, the stabilization fund. So this year we were lucky. We only had to access our reserve fund once. That would be for our new Forest Ward, well, 1986. Forest Ward's uh, pumper truck. We had a 1975 Ford that just, I, we couldn't keep it going. I tried as much as I could, but we got an excellent deal for a cost of only $10,000 for a much newer truck uh, that was used only sporadically down the West Stockbridge. So that's, that's why it's down to 165, but we had no other expenses out of that. That money, if you pass this article, will go into the stabilization fund. I believe the grand total of stabilization if you pass the article will be $631,000, which I feel is important going into fiscal 22 because we don't know what the economy will look like as we build the fiscal 22 budget. So we'll have a, a, a comfortable amount of money in there if we have to. So I was quite pleased that we were able to put that money back into stabilization for this year. Any other questions for Article 8? Okay, for, articles 14 through 17 are the annual authorization articles allowing the Board of Selectmen to, through the Community Development Director's Department, to apply for grants, uh, for the treasurer to borrow if needed, and to accept perpetual care funds. Questions? Get to the bid stuff. Here we go. Article 18, um, articles 18 through 20 of the bylaw amendments. And this does include the 40R. 18 and 19 first. Let's do 18 and 19 first. <laughs> we'll do 18 and 19 first. Uh, revolving fund spending limits. 
And then Article 19 is the compensation. Yeah, about the Adams Memorial Revolving Fund. Mm -hmm. Now, as part of the building is sold, does that revolving fund dissolve with that? No. <laughs> That fund will remain as long as the public has interest in the building. So if we keep the gymnasium, the auditorium, we would keep that. Yes. Okay. First in 19 is the compensation plan for non, just non-represented employees. For non-represented, non-union employees. Okay, here we go. Article 20. Right, so we got into we got into a lot. Mr. Robinson has a really good question. So we got into this. I we know it's a lot of reading. It's a substantial bylaw. But I would suggest section A on page 17 is important to digest. And then at the end of the article, Donna has put in some uh, additional language, I believe it's in here. Yes, that also gives you some background on it. It looks complicated to you, and it is, but it's really meant to control the development coming in if the developer chooses to use a development under 40 yards. Design guidelines uh, to ensure that the project is a project that fits into the character of the community. It is a zoning bylaw. And it is an overlay bylaw, which means the underlying zoning remains in force and effect. If I am a developer that comes into Adams and I'm looking at developing a property and I want to do some commercial, I want to do some housing, I can choose to build a project under the existing zoning, chapter 125 of our bylaws, or I can choose this bylaw, if we should pass it, to use either, either speed for a developer. There might be some pros to use in 40 r There might be some cons. There might be some pros to use the underlying zoning. They may not. So it is not forcing anyone to do anything with their property. It's making a scheme available. As I said, it allows the developer, oh, you have 40 r Let me look at that. That makes more sense. They may not submit a project. So it's optional for the developer. If you don't pass it, the developer never has that option. So if they come in and they say, you want to use 40R, we say we don't have it, it may not, it may not make sense for them to do it because they can't raise the proper capital. The other thing to keep in mind with 40R is because the state would like communities to pass it, what we are finding, and Donna can, can explain this more, but as we access, we do access a lot of grant programs for the state, we're being asked on our application or asked we're talking with state agencies. Has your community adopted Mass General Laws 40 r When you say no, your application goes in one file. And if you say yes, it goes into another. And we access a lot of grant programs. So we do not want to be caught essentially with our pants down, not, not having this you know, on the books. So that's another thing to, to keep in mind as you digest whether or not this is something you're, you're going to support. Uh, that's that's the critical piece for us. MassWorks grant, you just applied. Uh, again, we've used a lot of MassWorks money uh, for a variety of different projects in town. Uh, we've just submitted another application to finish some of the, the work up at the Glen and infrastructure work up there. So we don't want to disadvantage ourselves. Uh, and remember, this program is optional. It's a, it's a discretionary program. So I, I hope uh, I had to teach myself a lot about this. So I hope I'm able to share some of that with you, Donna's here, if you have any additional questions about it. The other program in Article 21 is the zoning changes for Commercial Street, uh, really just updating our zoning. The two are separate, but they are all zoning bylaws. Sorry, Sarah, I cut you off. Sarah, you want to start? Then Mr. Sarah, Mr. Robinson, and then over there. <laughs> they got it, Right. Right. So your scenario would be we pass it, we get a project, it turns out, whoa, 
Right, we don't like it, it's not working for us, etc. We come back, we have town meeting, we vote to repeal it. The only key is um, a project that is built and developed stays, but we would say, okay, not working for us, repeal it. What does stay, just for clarity, because a few people have asked me about it, you read the bylaws in here. If you're a developer and you choose to access that public money, you have an obligation for 30 years to offer those units agreed upon, whether it's two, three, four, ten, whatever, at affordable rates. And we'll get into, uh, we have a little bit more of a presentation for you of some of the nuts and bolts. That's the only thing that would stay. So, so, but, so, we, so that 30 year, we For that specific project. Okay. But if you repeal the bylaw, no new project can come in under that permitting but scheme. In but because they use public money, they are locked in. That's the trade off. You know, as I, I probably said this before, but when you choose to use someone else's money, the strings come with it. That's the string for a developer using 40 r But if we don't put it on the books as an option, we'll never know what we lose. We never know what walks out the door. Oh, you don't have 40 r Come out of here. As opposed to say, oh, you have 40 yards, let me talk to you. It, it may still not work for them. But just from my perspective, I'm, I'm just, I want to make towns as attractive as possible to developers. And I feel like if this is, you know, I know one or two other communities in the Berkshire that are starting to look more at this because they know developers want access to that capital. So just, Haley just whispered in my ear. So if we want, we can go through the other six articles. And then come back to 40 yard because the administrator um, they do have a presentation strictly on 40 yard to take you through the nuts and bolts. So if we want to do that, uh, since that's going to be the questions. Personally, I would prefer not to go through the nuts and bolts because it's getting cold. Okay. okay. All right. My only okay. question, my my question, only question on <laughs> Article 20 is: Are there other towns out there that we can look at? To find out whether or not 40 yard does in fact work or supports 40 yard in that it brought development into those towns and enhanced the quality of life in the town. Go ahead, Don. Um, there's, there's several. Um, okay. The state has done a report also on the program. Um, so I can certainly get that. Well, you know, for the public uh, notice, I mean, before the meeting, because everything I've seen, and I don't want to generalize, I've done some research, and it's always been negative, okay, in the 40 yard, in respect to 40 yard, density of population, so on so forth. I would like to be able to look at something to say to me, it's worth the town of Adams getting involved in this. That's all. Awesome. Is this going to be up on the website? Okay. Yes. And they're going to put up tomorrow on the website, the town's website, for your information. Thank you. The other thing I found that uh, I've heard that before, and the one thing I, I would say is so I, I digested it, I thought that through. I think what's important is to look very carefully at what properties have been identified as being 40 R capable, or what we've identified as being, you know, that's a, that's a good 40 R project. If you look at the grand scheme of the total number of units available, it's like 600 and something units. The likelihood of any developer ever building that, and we hope that at some point down the road, we have 600 and something new housing units, because that means good, you know, good tax base. The likelihood of that is not. I think our impact is going to be in smaller crops like Memorial. You know, you're not talking a large number of units. Um, you're talking about, you know, Jones Armory Block, I think has a dozen units. So the effect on Adams just, Yes, it's good to look at how what other communities impact has been, but it's also very much a community centric program. In other words, if you look at if Chickpea used it, Chickpea may have used it in a particular way, their bylaw may be different than ours. It may not always be apples to apples or oranges to oranges. So I think that's why for us, you know, Donna and her team spent time drafting that bylaw that works for Adams, that works for us, and that's why you know, we'll take it one project you know, at a time. Uh, or if we didn't think it was going to work, if we thought it was messy, if we think we didn't have controls, I, I don't think we'd be putting it forward. No, I, no, don't get me wrong. I'm not criticizing anyone. Just this is a big event in respect to the future of this town. 
Mm -hmm. If you have 600 units of new housing, which is great, yeah. as long as they're paying the taxes that I pay, mm -hmm. I'm wonderful. Right. Mm -hmm. We're going to have 600, possibly, or 500 new kids in the school system. That is, we get the economy of scale, right. which is what right. we need to. Yep. But in the same token, if I'm looking at a high density project that doesn't go anywhere, doesn't do anything. To support the town, and I don't want to. Yeah, okay. I'm sorry. Just wait. Mrs. Taylor. Okay, um, as far as um, saying like the Jones block, he's almost finished with the block with these drywall ceilings. Now, he would be eligible for the 40R, even yes. though the project is long starting years ago. Because he still needs, still needs money to finish it. So he can go to the state. So he can and apply say, for that yes. as. Uh, an already started project, so he's not really looking at the beginning of the project. No. He has to make this much affordable. No. Well, and, and that yeah, was, was, that was a different developer. I mean, it was a totally different developer that started the project. So, a developer, a new developer could come forward, use 4 r to finish it. Unless um, the, the original developer is gone, is, is it looking for something? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Okay. 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 Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry. No, that's okay. It's so so a good, good question. Developer is the project, really. Mm -hmm. And, and, okay. and, and I, I can't, there, there's things that are ready to be made public and not, but we're, you know, we've spoken with uh, a well established developer from, from over in New York State. And they're interested in the building, they're interested in the property. And when they learned about Massachusetts 40 yards smart growth overlay, they were interested because it's that it's they can raise X amount of capital, they know what they're gonna to have to put in the building to finish. And when they realize, so I can rent two units at affordable rates and I can get a hundred thousand dollars from Massachusetts to finish my building. See, that seems like a fair trade. They weren't familiar with the program, but when we explained it to them, they said oh, we have to do more research on it. No one has said, oh, absolutely not. I don't want anything to do with that. Nobody has said that. So my existing project isn't really an existing project anymore. It's a new project. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so, yeah. And we want, that, we want them to finish that. We want to put those people in there. Okay. Mr. Ketchum? Uh, yeah, I just want to be clear on this. Yeah. Uh, the, the 30 R and the overlay that will only apply in those service life subdistricts on page 19. Yes. And does that change in any respect uh, the town's obligation under uh, 40B, where we have to supply 10% target affordable housing? So, Yes, it does, and it changes it into our favor as a community. Right now, without 40R, and Donna can stop me if I misspeak. Mm -hmm. Right now, the developer can come in and build a housing project under general law 40D because we're under that 10% number. They can just build it. No planning board review, no selecting review. They just build it, they do whatever they want. When a community adopts mass 40R, trips 40B out, Forces everything in through the 40 yard concept. That's the one trigger to that, too. So, if a person comes in and they want to build a development, they can either do it under the existing zoning or it has to be 40 yard. 40 B no longer applies. Did I have to speak with that, Don? It's just, I mean, this 40 B process, I mean, generally, yes, but the 40 B process still requires a public meeting. But it's like planning board, everybody together, one meeting, and then it's a done. That's why that's why the bylaw has so much technicality in it because it controls that. The developer knows up front, okay, if I'm gonna do a project under 40 R, I'm gonna read this because this this basically tells me what I need to do. What I read on the state website, I don't know if I remember this right, is about seven point four percent affordability. So the nine remaining uh, 2.6 would translate into units which now under the new body would be targeted into uh, these defined areas. Right, right. And, and I think your point is that 
that then, you know, if we get some of these projects, it contributes toward that and yeah. we inch our way up to that 10%. Yeah. Well, there's a few communities in Berkshire County that are better than their taxes. Right. So not uh, I do have a question relative to the inclusion. Uh, and this is maybe a, just the tax that's doing this. But I see in relation to the Adams Memorial School that the map as I look at it appears to also include the whole Valley Street field. And how is that going to be handled if you get a private development where I presume the town wants to keep the athletic? Well, the reason we showed that is because currently it is a single it is parcel, a single but uh, presumably that would be divided. Um, that that is the understanding. That's what we presented to developers. You're not getting the alley field as part of the deal. Um, but where you know where that dividing line? We have suggested it in the RFP. We actually show the dividing line, but that would happen in a future. Um, uh, they're going to have the parking issue. Correct. Part of the bylaws. Part of parking. Okay. Thank you. Anything else, Sunshine? Do you have any uh, first up to the first one? That's where it's going to be. That's where it's going to be. Subdistrict. Subdistrict. Does Donna want to do it? Go ahead, Donna. I'm going to take that. I'm sorry. Well, I didn't do it. Subdistricts. The subdistricts. Oh, subdistricts. Yeah, mm -hmm. It's on page 19 in our book. So, so District A is Park Street, uh, B is the schools, school areas, and we just um, group these. Uh, Park Street, there's three buildings, um, Jones Block, Armory Block, and um, the actual former Armory. Um, the school smart district is, um, oh, this, uh, what is it, where the Adams Stove is now, that's one of the buildings. Uh, we've included um, uh, Hoosick Elementary because there has been some discussion about far into the future, there could be, uh, Hoosick Valley could be a single campus uh, school district. Yes. So we were just thinking ahead, designating, you know, Plumpet School as a potential future um, uh, you know, possibility for housing. They're also broken up that way because they're restricted in terms of what you can do even within 40R within those. So some you can do, so if you look at page 20, it spells that out. Some district A, Park Street, multifamily residential uses, mixed use consisting of a variety of different uses. You'll see sub district B restricts it a little bit more. So it can still be mixed use, but not every type of business can go in there, which is how zoning works anyway. So it's kind of, it just narrows it down. You can't just do anything, even though you're working within 40 yards, it still controls the character or the use of that building, that property. And then, um, sub district B, C is the mills. That's primarily five to seven Music Street. And um, so District B, there's um, some vacant property um, off of, uh, I don't remember it, but um, just north of Cook Street there. Uh, and, uh, and then, um, that's the purple range, that's uh, undeveloped land right. along Town Yep. So this map also on the website. For anyone who's interested. Yeah. Somewhere this, up in here. Yeah, and this is also after the meeting, come up, take a look. But I, I would just say that um, all of these properties that are proposed for inclusion in the 40R district have over the past 10, 15 years been discussed quite frequently for future housing development. This program gives us the ability to designate ahead of time where we want to see multifamily housing. So I think that's an important point. We're kind of directing 
in appropriate locations where we see this type of going. One of the questions that we heard last month, we all came up about the air authority, um, what income level is coming in, who's coming into our community? And I think that's a lot of worry for some people. So you know, whether it's North Adams, whether it's here, who's coming to our, our town? Is it low income? Is it really going to improve the town? Well, there's definitely a, a misunderstanding of affordable housing and low income housing. They're definitely. Margaret, can you just take You got it. Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm really, you can't really, I can't hear you. Um, so there's a, 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 there's a difference. They're low income and affordable income are two different things. And the, what Donna's talking about is affordable housing. And we do have a, a as part of the, nuts and bolts program on 40 r of what affordable housing looks like. It is, has been addressed like the new teacher that comes in and makes $48,000 a year falls under affordable housing. I mean, you can't discriminate against people, I know that. But that's been an issue with a lot of people that well, I've and I think, and I, Adams, Williamstown, yeah. wherever. I the think numbers, it's a misunderstanding of, of the term. The numbers will surprise you. We have, we're showing the numbers. If you're a single person and one of our properties is developed under 40 yards, you say, boy, I really like that complex. Here downtown, I can walk it simple. You can make upwards of $50,000 a year salary and qualify for affordable rent. Well, what's affordable rent? So for a one bedroom in fiscal year 20, that's $815 a month. If you do a two bedroom, that's $1,026. We're not talking bare bones rent even under the affordable program. There's two components to it. You get a lower rent, but your income has to be able to match that. And all that's verified by a housing contractor that the town would hire in order to keep the developer honest in terms of you have to apply, you have to have income ver verification, et cetera. So that's what we're talking about for, for rentals. That's not cheap rentals at, at all. So there is, as to Myra's point, that's the distinction. It's workforce housing. So who are we talking about? We're talking about your school teacher. You're talking about people on the opposite end on fixed income. You're talking about entry level police officers. You're talking about entry level general dynamics staff as well. Now, if you're two people, the salary goes up to about, I want to say it's 60 something thousand, 72,000 combined income, and your rent would go up as well. So we're not talking about Section 8, we're not talking about subsidized rental, we're talking about affordability, and that's in the context of it's a little bit more affordable than market rate. It's uh, comparable to rural the developer that was down in Myrtle Street. Yeah. Well, no, no, I, I, Myrtle Street, I don't think it's, yeah, a, it's a good comparison. Low income. But it's, it's not the, the same as Myrtle Street. You're referring to the higher contractors to set the rates up? Where is that in the development? You're assigned to something where that The developer pays for it. The developer pays for it. Pays for the verification of all the income, etc. That has to once the development is built. So we have so the development is built, and now we're at the point, the good point, where the developer says, "Okay, I'm ready to fill out my my housing." The developer has to pay for the contractor. The bear, we could do it internally, but we, we don't have the staff to do that. Uh, so they would pay for that. I think that's written in the that's written in the bylaw. Sir, so, sorry, I'm gonna be done with this. So, if my income is $20,000, I could still be 30% of my $20,000. You're starting to get into the nuts and bolts of the program. Sorry, just I not, need to do that. Uh, I, no, it's okay. I, I just don't know that those exact details about how the health. Can you answer that? What happens if their salary is twenty thousand dollars? Can they still access the? Well, they can, but they also they have to pay the rent that is below the ceiling for this. So again, this is this is not very low income. It's not intended for that. It's for people 
It's for workforce housing. It's the same numbers we use for our housing rehab program that we've done for decades in this town. Um, so it's 80% of medium household income. So 80% of median. Um, so it's, it's um, you know, it's, it's. So Sarah, I think to your point, if someone's making $20,000, but the median and it's a single person making 20,000, but the rent amount is $815, they have to pay $815. And they're here on 25. 30%. Or is it 30% of the 30% of the median household is what the said. Yeah. Got my outside list on the All right. Any other questions tonight on Article 20? Again, all up on the website. 21 are uh, zoning changes that support, as I understand, support the 40 yard. Some of these zoning changes. Oh, no, they're no. actually commercial. Commercial zoning. Yeah, so Article 21 is separate from Article 20. Article 21 deals with the commercial street area. We're talking about Hoosick Street to Myrtle, Myrtle to commercial, then Grove Street South. Our zoning, frankly, is archaic. And the key takeaway is, is if you compare patterns to other communities in terms of the amount of property we have available to develop commercially, we're low. We're about 1.8%. Lennox, 4%. It's fields got about 6%. So what we're trying to do is figure out why we're not getting development in some of these areas that are commercial. So when Donna and her team went and looked through here, the older zoning, if you look at these carefully, they're on the web page. The top portions here are the existing zoning. The bottom maps show the correction. Essentially, what they're, we're doing is, is we're freeing up properties that are restricted because of the archaic zoning. So you may have a parcel on commercial street that the front of it, I want to put a bakery in, but the back of the building I can't because the zoning line goes right down the middle of the building. So the zoning officer says, sorry, you can't do it. Yeah. So the building sits there fallow because our zoning doesn't fit. So what Don and her team essentially did is we looked at this and we cleaned it up. So the properties are more reflective of being able to encourage commercial development. Don, is there anything more that you want to say about that? So the phenomenon that Jay's talking about is split parcels. They're split by multiple zoning. And it goes back to when they did the zoning, it basically, as a convenience, you know, brought this, um, the B2 zoning district, you know, along the along commercial street, along Park Street, they just brought it back 500 feet. But as he's saying, some of the parcels are deeper than that. So the front is zone business, the back is often zone um, residential. And it, we have seen over the years that this is um, an impediment from a lot of existing businesses expanding their businesses. Gary Brothers, years ago, is a, a perfect case in point. They wanted to expand, but the back of their property is zone R4. Uh, the other thing that we did with this is we looked at where properties that have been um, currently and have continued to be run as commercial, but they're zoned residential. So that's a non-conforming use. So we took and we looked at those properties and we um, proposed them to be rezoned as business. And then we also, because we're so limited, uh, our settlement pattern, our zoning pattern is essentially established. So we looked at where along the commercial street corridor could we kind of shoehorn in some properties um, and, and um, you know, zone them commercial uh, when they were proximate to existing commercial or where they had previously been used as commercial. There's um, a few isolated cases. It's, it's intended to be a more rational, more logical approach. It does, it does not create, you know, um, acres and acres of new commercial zoning. We just don't have the land for that, but it will create a more logical and rational approach to zoning. And it'll um, uh, hopefully allow businesses to expand in the future. We're down to this exercise. Yeah. Years ago? Yes. Years ago. Ah.
for this particular article. And Kaylee is handing out to everyone here maps for this particular article. We also still have a couple of uh, copies left of the income guidelines and the rental guidelines under 4 yards. So if you want to know more about how that works, these will explain that. Yeah. Okay. Other questions on Article 21? Let me better notify Mother Nature. It needs to be about 10 degrees warmer Thursday night. Oh, I put in a request. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Okay, so under the miscellaneous article, so I'm doing a little, actually the mask is keeping me warm. Um, article 22 is um, the Quaker Meeting House and repairs need to be done and they want to appropriate $6,500 from the Quaker Meeting House budget. Okay. Article 23, this is um, the Hoosick Valley Regional School District. Um, it's the first of two payments for Adam's share for a, in a deficit from last year? So the school district for two years charged us less money than they should have. It was a clerical error on their part. Said error has been fixed. However, we owe them money. This is the correction uh, article in order to pay them uh, what we owe them. This will be payment one of two. We're paying the district. And the second payment is for next year or another time this year? This is the one for this year. You will see another one on next year's article in the lesser amount, which is probably a better <laughs> scenario based on the <laughs> <laughs> time. I don't I think it's fifty something thousand dollars total, so it's thirty-five this year. I want to say it's about fifteen next year. If this year and they're quarterly payments. Okay, um, any other questions on Article 23? Special articles, Articles 24 through 26. Um, appropriations from the Economic Development Fund. Yeah, I do have one question yeah. about the land acquisition for um, the elementary school. Is that the mobile station? It is. Okay, that was my only question. I was yes. wondering where it was. Okay. That's that, it. That would, that would be it. Mr. Pepper. And I take it we're going to turn that down. <laughs> Right. Yes. Uh, what's the status of the federal fund for currency of town taxes and uh, the environmental fund? So 26 Commercial Street is the property the town would like to acquire. That's current on the taxes. A phase one environmental study review has been done. It's mostly with those gasoline alley, so the majority of contaminants petroleum. There are two underground storage tanks that are empty. Look, we have done that work preliminarily before we even know what we want to get into. We've used grant money to do it. We'll continue to use grant money to clean it up to the point where we think our goal is to demolish the building and just level it out, use it as additional parking for the business community during a safer drop off area to the school district. That's 26 Commercial Street. 50 Commercial Street is the old Duco Collision Building. It's fenced off. There are two taxable parcels within that, and we have one demo lien on it. The grant the demo lien is about 66000 The outstanding taxes on there, plus the demo lien, we're talking about $150,000. This, if you pass this article, the town will release the liens on 50 Commercial Street. The owner will put it into the proper tax, bring it up to the current tax payment. We would acquire 26 Commercial Street and do so free of any encumbrances or problems with that, that property. The goal is to get 50 Commercial Street to into the private hands to develop it and put it on the tax. Because the taxes keep accruing on that, along with the demo lien, it's becoming not really feasible for, you know, if it's value of 80, 90, 100,000 dollars, you're still paying 250, 300,000 dollars for it because they got to clear the lien. So, going to the beginning of the demo, 
All of the tax liens and the general liens will be released. He has to bring the property up. Yes. It is a lot of tax liens. Yeah. The goal is he, he told us, I want to sell it, but I know I'm not going to be able to sell the love liens, nor am I ever going to be able to pay the town with what I owe the town. I'd love to come in and just cut a check for it, but we're realistic. So, you know, what's the likelihood of 26 Commercial Street as well ever being developed by, by a private developer? And um, we've attempted a couple of times to acquire that property, and it's fallen through. So, this is the best opportunity. So, there's no cash exchange for it. Uh, we'll use, we'll access grant, grant funds to, to finish it up, clean it up, and hopefully, he'll sell 50 Commercial Street and get it on the tax roll. Other questions for Article 24, 25, 26? No. This property was offered to the town for $20,000. Yes, That's what I understand. Yeah. Now it's offering us basically $150,000 in the same If If you assume we're ever going to get $150,000, the likelihood of that is probably not, just not, not really. That's the, that's the trade. If you feel that that property owner 50 Commercial Street is going to pay us $150,000 or a future developer is going to come in, why I really want that parcel off through the lien side, then yes, I would say we're losing out of that money. But it's money we've never had. It's money owed to the town. It's, it's paper money. That's one of the theories that we, we have with this, this deal. And he wants to get rid of 50 Commercial Street. So he gets rid of 50 Commercial Street, he sells it puts it on the tax rolls, we get our hands on 26 Commercial Street, which is a smaller parcel, smaller taxation anyway, and we improve that entrance corridor into the town. It's part and parcel of our entire efforts to make the entrance corridor look better in the community, is that Commercial Street's about $7 million, seven, $8 million in commercial. So our, our goal is, let's see what we can do to make that look better. And that parcel, I was at half on your house just the other night, and I'm sitting there, my eyes always end up going over to that mobile station across um, as other people have said too. So we think it's the best deal at, at this point. We did have somebody interested in buying 26 Commercial Street. It's always a risk if somebody else is going to buy it, what are they going to do with it? It's still always going to sit there fallow. So those were some of our considerations. Too. We would be, yes. Yes. What's that? No, the town. The town. The town. Yes. Would be. Yes. Well, I, unfortunately, we can't go back and fix the mistake. So the best we can do is look forward. But it's really, it's really, there is no cost to the town. Um, the the demolition, the cleanup of 26 commercial, we would pursue grants. Uh, we've already identified the working grant. Now. If the town meeting approves this article, we have ident identified another grant with EPA. The um, application is due the end of October. So we would apply for the cleanup. Um, the, the 50 commercial street, the goal is to return this to productive use return it to the town tax rolls. Uh, yes, does it, do we not get the 150,000? It's our position, we'll never get the 150,000. The, the um, liens will keep going up by, you know, the fees uh, for not paying it keep going up and, and it, it becomes less and less attractive to a future purchaser. So in this way, we're gonna be getting um, the extra parking we need for the school, we'll clean it up, and we'll return 50 commercial back to productive use and on the tax rolls. So I think we'll be um, much, you know, we'll be ahead much sooner if we pursue Now we get the school really needs a place to park. There's no parking there. It's a good advantage in other ways. Any other questions on these three articles? Okay, last one is a citizen's petition. Um, this is a veterans tax work off program that has been presented um, by a citizen to be acted on by the town meeting. This is very consistent with what we currently have, which is a senior citizens tax work off program. 
Questions? Mr. Baker? I don't know if membership in the Massachusetts National Guard is active uh, soldiers, if they qualify for that, or long term uh, members of the National Guard who's been in 20 years. If they're discharged with a DD 214, they qualify. So that's your general discharge paperwork in the military. And I, I would just add to that, for whatever reason, if they ever were not, they would, under these guidelines, still qualify for the other senior draft. Okay. Should they be a senior? Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then any other business? And I will leave. <laughs> so, um, but just to let you know, Christine has been working her magic trying to get us some heaters because we can't count on Mother Nature. But more importantly, don't promise anything. <laughs> no promising, but she's trying to work her magic. Um, but I really want to thank oh, Chuck. I want to thank um, Chuck Felix and uh, his group from the Adams Agricultural Fair Committee. They set up tonight. They've been wonderful in helping the town. Um, prepare for this. So Chuck. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you. I look forward to seeing you all Thursday night. Thank you for coming out.